thank you uh, for the introduction and thanks a lot for having me. Like I said, it's a, it's a treat to be part of this, this seminar. Uh, okay, so I'll just uh, jump right in. <clears throat> uh, so um, I want to start by thinking about uh, propositional dynamic logic. And I'm not going to uh, go through all the definitions. Probably they're familiar to many people here. But just at a high level to motivate the sort of uh, ideas behind the talk, um, let's think about propositional dynamic logic. Uh, and this is a framework for reasoning about, uh, you can interpret it as non-deterministic program execution. You don't have to interpret it as program execution. You can interpret it sort of more broadly as actions or whatever. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be thinking specifically about program executions just for concreteness. I think it helps bring out some of the intuitions. So models for propositional dynamic logic are uh, relational structures or Kripke structures, um, which are interpreted as state transition diagrams. So what that means is that you've got a, a set of states and each program is associated with a binary relation. Um, so each program pi is associated with a binary relation r pi on the state space. And uh, an edge between states, so if we have here some uh, initial state and then an edge to some other state, the uh, intuitive interpretation is that uh, this state here, call it y, is one possible result of executing program pi in state x. So because it's a relation and not a uh, function, um, there can be multiple uh, possible results of executing a program, and that's why it's a model for non-deterministic program execution. Right? Um, so I am assuming here that people are um, roughly familiar with uh, uh, relational structures, but I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions at any point to, to clarify things. Okay, so the language of propositional dynamic logic is uh, includes a, a unary modality. I'll take the, the diamond version as basic. So a unary modality uh, for each program. So it's a family of un unary modalities. And we interpret it uh, in the standard way that we interpret a, a diamond modality. Uh, so we say, uh, x satisfies uh, after pi phi if and only if there is some accessible state where accessibility is with respect to the r pi relation uh, that is a phi state. Okay, so the interpretation then again, sort of very straightforwardly, is that uh, this kind of formula is true at a state just in case some possible execution of the program pi results in phi being true. Right, bounded existential quantification over the possible results of executing pi over the r pi accessible worlds. Now, the motivation for this talk is to explore this idea of possibility. Right? When we talk about a possible execution of pi, what is the sense of possibility? What do we mean by a possible execution of pi? And specifically in this talk, I want to explore an epistemic account of possibility. I want to see uh, if we can make sense of that epistemically. So let's take a first stab at that. Um, and there's going to be sort of a question mark here because this is, you know, spoiler, this is not going to work uh, out very well. But as a, as a first stab at trying to interpret the sense of possibility involved in non-deterministic program execution uh, epistemically, let's ask if we can interpret non-determinism as a kind of uncertainty, right? Epistemic uncertainty. So there's sort of two obvious steps to, to, to do this. Um, since we're trying to interpret um, the, the non-determinism, we don't want to sort of bake it in. So the first step is to restrict our attention to relational structures where the relation that interprets program execution is actually just a function. Right? So um, it's easy enough to reinterpret uh, our models so that rather than there being multiple possible uh, 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 outcomes of a given program pi, there's only ever one, right? So we have a function instead of a relation. And just to emphasize that in the language, I'll use this uh, notation here um, uh, after pi phi uh, and interpret it in, in exactly the same way we did before, except now instead of looking at uh, uh, a relation, we have a function. So there's a unique output of executing the program pi in any given state, and we look at that output and we check if it's a phi world. So this is just now sort of makes it look like uh, something like a temporal logic. And now as a second step, because of course, 
once we've done this, we've lost the non-deterministic aspect, but we're trying to reanalyze the non-determinism as a kind of uncertainty. So we need to get it back somehow. And the idea uh, that's, that's sort of suggested vaguely here on this first line is let's try to interpret the non-determinism as a kind of uncertainty. So let's enrich the logical setting with uh, just for now, let's take a standard knowledge modality, call it K with dual uh, K hat. So this is the, the diamond version of the, of the um, box type modality K. Um, so we have, you know, K is a knowledge modality, K hat is the sort of, uh, you consider it possible modality. And now the idea is to put together the epistemics with the dynamics, uh, the dynamics with the epistemics, to try to get an interpretation of uh, a non-deterministic possibility. So here we have um, from the classical language of PDL, uh, this formula says, Pi is a possible result of executing the program pi. And here we have a possible um, interpretation of that in this new language. And it says uh, it's compatible with the agent's knowledge that executing pi produces a phi world. Right? So just to emphasize, this part here is purely deterministic because it's interpreted by a function. But we're getting something that looks like a range of possibilities by uh, putting this uh, K hat modality in front. Right? So we're interpreting the possibility aspect of it as a kind of uncertainty. Um, okay, so this is what I just said. I guess I should have switched the slide. So um, uh, the non deterministic outcomes of pi on this view, if I take this as the sort of uh, the, the reimagining of, 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 the, of, of, P, of the PDL modality. The non-deterministic outcomes of pi are just those that are compatible with the agent's current state of knowledge. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, that doesn't really make sense, then I'm, I'm with you on that. This, this, this kind of definition, it's maybe the most, it's the first thing you might think of if your goal is to, is to give an epistemic interpretation of non-determinism. Uh, but it seems to miss the essence of non-determinism, right? So for example, um, you know, we have this knowledge modality, which is the, the, the knowledge of some agent. But that means that if we have some very uninformed agent, a very ignorant agent, then on this definition, we're forced to interpret pi as having many possible non-deterministic outcomes. But that's, that's, that sort of misses the point. There's a clear distinction intuitively between the outcomes of a program that are possible as far as some maybe really ignorant agent knows versus those outcomes that would remain possible even with good information. And it's this latter concept which seems closer to the uh, idea of a non-deterministic possibility, uh, possible outcome of a program. So it has nothing to do, or it shouldn't have anything to do with how um, poorly informed some given agent is. It should have to do with what you can find out in principle. That's the idea. So to make that a little bit clearer, let's just consider two toy examples. Um, one is a sort of canonical example of something that we typically want to consider to be a non-deterministic uh, program. Uh, I say typically, you know, there's some, we, we, can, we can talk about, uh, uh, we can talk about when you might not want to consider it. But uh, for now, just take as a sort of typical canonical example of a non-deterministic program, a random number generator, right? And it's not just that um, you, the agent, don't know what number is going to be generated. Uh, but that you're unable in principle to determine that in advance. It's not just that you happen to not know, but you could find out. It's that you can't find out. That's the whole point of it being a random number generator. And by contrast, we can imagine a program that simply does something like prints the next entry in some uh, given publicly accessible database. And we don't want to call that program non-deterministic, even if the agent that we're currently considering happens to have not checked the database and doesn't currently know what, the, what, what its contents are. The point is they could check it. So the program is not non-deterministic, even though they don't happen to know right now what it will do. Okay, so this was maybe a long-winded uh, way of just saying we want to respect this distinction between um, what a given agent currently happens to know versus what they could come to know. And that respecting that distinction is somehow going to be crucial for understanding uh, non-deterministic program execution. So let me just pause for a sec, take a sip of water, and if anyone has any um, questions or comments that they want to interject with. <clears throat> okay, uh, feel free to uh, interrupt me at any point. So, so look, um, 
uh, I take myself to have motivated here that what we need is a formal notion of uh, what an agent could come to know, right, rather than what they currently happen to know. Uh, and, and that's motivated by this idea of trying to understand non-deterministic program execution uh, epistemically. And now to do that, uh, I am going to use the tools of topology. So if I could, I don't know if it will work or not, but if I could, if people wouldn't mind, can I just get uh, by like a yes or no vote? Like, um, you know, yes, I, I already know topology. I've seen it before versus like, no, I, I, I don't, I'm not really that familiar with it. Just so that I get a sense of the room. Okay, cool. So it looks like there's a mix. A bunch of people say yes, and some people more shaky. In general, I design my talks assuming that a good portion of the audience has either never seen topology before or like has, but it's not exactly at the at the uh, you know uh, tip of their their brains. By which I mix metaphors. Um, so that's great. So I I, I I'm going to spend the next few slides. Um, not I'm not going to give you the sort of standard you know. Uh, math textbook introduction to topology. I'm going to motivate it specifically for the purposes that I want to use it for, which are epistemic purposes. It's it's equivalent to the, of course, to the normal definitions, but it's a it's a different view on it. So even if you've already seen topology, there might might still be something new here for you. And if you haven't, I'm not going to assume any any particular knowledge. Okay. So the point is what, what the point here, going back to the to the thread of the talk is like I was saying, we want models that are rich enough to encode some kind of notion of potential knowledge. And I'm going to use topology to, uh, to, to, to uh, the topological structure is going to give me that richness. So topological spaces are abstract models of spatial structure, which encode nearness without necessarily specifying a distance metric. Sometimes it's thought of as rubber sheet geometry, because it's like geometry, but you can bend and stretch things. And that's a weird introduction to give to something which is supposed to have an epistemic interpretation, because it's very unclear why rubber sheet geometry would have anything to do with epistemology. So I'm not going to approach it from the rubber sheet geometry perspective. I'm going to try to approach it from the epistemic perspective. Um, but first, let me just motivate a basic idea, which is almost pre-theoretic, at least certainly it's, it's not specific to either geometry or epistemology. Um, let's just think about sets. Okay? Consider a set X. That'll be like our universe. Think, you can think of it as like the state space if you like. Um, and a point little x in X marked right here. And a subset of X, A, which I'll take to be um, all the points that are inside this oval. Um, that's my set A. Now, here's a basic fact of, of set theory. Either X is in A or X is not in A. That's, that's just how sets work. There's no such thing as being partly in a set. You're either in a set or you're not in a set. As far as set theory is concerned, set membership is a binary affair. But you might ask, and this is the beginning of articulating a notion of topology, whether it ever makes sense to think of membership as a kind of a graded notion, right? where I mean graded very broadly here, graded in any sense at all. And spatial intuitions, right? very general spatial intuitions, provide at least one context where this seems natural. So I'll tap into some spatial intuitions to, to do a bit of the motivating here. Um, uh, so we have a point X here, which seems like it's just fully robustly inside the set A. And then we have a point Y, which is like right on the boundary, right? If I interpret A as including this solid line here, then Y is technically a member of A, but it's kind of like just barely. It's not as, as good of a member of A as X is. X is robustly in A, Y not so much. Y is barely in A. So how could we formalize that intuition? Because like we said, set theory alone doesn't, doesn't give us the tools to do that. It just says X is in and Y is in. They're both equally good members of A. But if we want to formalize the intuition that X is somehow more a member of A than Y is, then we might pursue the following idea. We might say X is robustly in A if there exists a set U, which sort of acts as a witness to X's membership in A. So I'm drawing here, this U is like a cushion like a cushion of space around X, so it contains X and is itself contained in A. That's why I call it a witness to X's membership in A. Okay, so the idea is in the picture here and it's written out down here in words. Um, 
Give me one second. I don't know if it's affecting you guys, but my sunlight screen changing thing is in effect. Okay, I fixed it. Sorry. So uh, in words here, they, we have this idea that X is robustly in A if there's this uh, witnessing set which contains X and is contained in A. Um, whereas we look over here at, uh, at Y and sort of intuitively we try to find witnessing sets and we see that um, it looks uh, to be hard or impossible to find a witnessing set for Y. And by the way, one of the intuitions here is like uh, these sets represent um, something like error. So here's the point X. Here, this witnessing set is sort of like a measurement that tells you where might X be, but it has some error. It doesn't tell you exactly where X is. But even a set U that has some error uh, might still be enough to tell you something meaningful about X, namely that it's in A, as this set U does. Whereas I go over here Y, and even if I take very, very good measurements of where Y is, it's even this measurement is still compatible with Y being outside of the set A. So that gives you a sense of the epistemic connection. Now, before we go any further with this, we have to point out a problem with this definition. X is robustly in A if there exists a set U which contains X and is contained in A. That doesn't actually work very well as a definition because uh, as stated, I can just take U to be the singleton set Y. And then I get a witness, technically. And so it's easy to see that the um, notion of robust membership it's just equivalent to regular membership. So we've gained nothing by that definition, right? So it's the wrong definition technically, but it's the right intuition. And the way to correct the technical definition is exactly what defines a topological space, which is we're going to put into effect a restriction on what counts as a witness. We're not just going to let any old set, like a singleton set or a weird looking set, whatever. We're not going to let any set count as a witness. We're going to restrict what counts as a witness. So here is the um, definition, more or less, without some of the details of a topological space. It's the important part of it. Topological space is a set X together with a collection T called the topology on X, consisting of subsets of X, which are called open sets. And the idea of, of what, what are we doing by equipping a set X with a, a collection T is we're saying T specifies what the legal witnesses are. And then instead of saying robust, we say in robust membership, we say interior. That's the official word in topology. We say X is in the interior of A. We write it like this, X is in the interior of A. If there exists an open set, namely a member of this collection, uh, which contains X and is contained in A. So it's the exact same intuition as before. The only difference is that U is now restricted and must be drawn from this collection of open sets. So it's precisely by specifying the collection of open sets, namely by restricting what counts as a witness, that we endow a, a regular set with something like spatial structure. Or alternatively, with something like a notion of measurement with error, depending on which intuition you take. Um, so, uh, I forgot I had slides about this, so I'll, I'll just, um, this is what I was sort of saying before. We can think of you, this witness, as a piece of evidence that imperfectly indicates the true state of the world. That's what I was saying before. So the points in you are precisely those that are compatible with the evidence. So I took a measurement, and this is what's compatible with the measurement that I took. And so, uh, like I said, even though it might not be precise enough to tell you the exact state of the world, it might still be informative. In this case, you is informative enough to tell you that X lies in the set A. And now to connect that to the notion of interior, which is the, the sort of key connection here. So um, I want to emphasize this. The definition of X is in the interior of A is there exists a legal witness, a member of the topology, which contains X and is contained in A. So now if I translate that into the intuition in terms of measurement, what it's saying is the interior of A consists of exactly those points where A is measurably true. X is in the interior of A just in case it's possible to take a measurement which is compatible with the true state of the world and which implies A. So the interior of A are the points of A that are where A is measurably true or where A could come to be known, right, by some sufficiently good measurement. Right, so again, the topology tells us what are the, what's the sort of state, what's the, what, what, what are the collection of uh, potential measurements you could take? And uh, on that view, the interior operator is just telling us 
what could we come to know given the available potential measurements? So that's the connection be between topology and epistemology that links the interior operator and topology to a notion of potential knowledge. I'm going to take another sip of water and, and see if anyone has uh, any questions at this point. Okay. So uh, let's uh, put this into a logic so that we can combine it with what we wanted to do before and start reasoning about it. So let's take uh, the basic modal language. So just uh, uh, classical propositional logic together with uh, a box modality. And I'm going to interpret the box in this context as phi is knowable. And I'm going to interpret this language in topological models so that I can use the interior operator to give semantics to the thing in the language that I want to interpret as knowability. Right? I've already explained why the interior operator should be viewed or can be viewed as capturing a kind of uh, potential knowledge or knowability or measurability. So now I just want to encode that in the semantics for a logic. So a topological model is just a topological space together with a valuation function, which does the normal thing. It assigns to each primitive proposition uh, a subset of the state space where it's true. And then the uh, semantic clauses just say, uh, you know, these ones are just the standard ones for Boolean connectives, right? P is true at X uh, if the valuation says it's true at X. Um, negation and conjunction work like they're supposed to work. And then lastly, the uh, box, box phi is true at X, just in case X is a member of the interior of phi, which again, just means that there is a potential measurement that can be taken, which is compatible with X and which entails phi. So that's why we're reading box phi as phi is knowable or phi is measurably true. It's not just true, you can actually measure it to be true. Um, of course, I should say uh, topological semantics for modal logic, exactly as presented here, are very old. They, in fact, predate um, cryptic semantics by a couple of decades. And uh, so I'm not doing anything new with the semantics here. The only thing sort of new that I've done, although it's also uh, exists in, in, in other works that I can point people to if they're interested in, is really emphasizing the epistemic interpretation of the topological models. Um, <clears throat> okay, so one thing that's going to be useful for us that I want to sort of flag here before we get back to the main theme of the talk is, um, as usual, diamond is an abbreviation uh, for the dual of box. It's not box not. And correspondingly, that means if we go through the semantics, uh, diamond phi is true at x, just in case, if you go through the semantics, uh, it ends up being true just in case x is in the closure of phi, which is, which if you don't know what that means, it's explained down here. And you can see this is the dual of the interior operator. X is in the closure of phi, just in case every measurement, right? It's, there's no surprise that we're getting a, a universal quantifier here instead of an existential one because we dualize things. Every measurement, that you could possibly take um, is such that if it's compatible with you with with x, then it's also compatible with phi. So the diamond is saying no matter how uh, carefully you take a measurement, no matter what observations you make, you're never going to be able to rule out phi. Every measurement that you take at x is going to be compatible with phi. So we might then read diamond phi as something like phi is unfalsifiable, right? No measurement you can take will rule out the possibility of phi. Okay, now I wanna bring these topological tools that I've laid out here, which, I mean, this is the general toolkit. I've used it in a number of uh, uh, papers and, and, and other people have used it, in, of course, in, in many contexts. I wanna bring it back to the, the topic at hand, which was, um, trying to interpret uh, non-deterministic non -deterministic program execution in a, uh, an epistemic way. So to do that, I want to combine the two structures that we already had. I want to take topological models and I want to add in uh, functions uh, which will interpret program executions, right? I'm, I'm using functions because I want executions to be sort of fundamentally deterministic and for the non-deterministic aspect to arise on uh, sort of on top as an, as an epistemic effect in some sense. 
So uh, first, let me say, if you take a topological model and you just equip it with a single function uh, going from x to x, um, this is uh, called a dynamic topological model, and they've been studied in depth. Uh, here's the reference. Um, by the way, for a, a longer and more complete list of references, I can, I can pass the paper on to anyone who's interested in, 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 in these topics. I'm, I'm happy to, to do that. It's also available on my website. Um, so a topological model equipped with a function is called a dynamic topological model. And of course, it's trivial. If we want to, we can also equip a topological model with a family of functions, say parameterized by the collection of programs that we want to interpret, and then expand the basic language uh, with the dynamic modalities that we defined previously. So this is just the same definition that we had previously, right? After pi phi is true, just in case um, the, the uh, output, uh, uh, just in case when you apply the function uh, corresponding to pi to x, of course, the, the state that you get makes phi true. So this is the same definition of, as before. Um, and, but now we're doing this in a topological model. So we also have the interior operator around. And uh, this gives us a setting which is rich enough to realize our earlier intuition. Right? So remember, our earlier intuition was we shouldn't be relying on what some agent currently happens to know or consider possible. We should instead be thinking about what is potentially knowable or potentially uh, unfalsifiable. Um, so what we can do is identify the non-deterministic outcomes of a program with those that cannot be ruled out by any feasible measurement. So this should look familiar. It's exactly the um, uh, attempt that I discarded before, except instead of a K hat, I have a diamond. So instead of uh, a modality here, before it was K hat, which, which was um, possible as far as some agent knows. Now I have the diamond, which is um, unfalsifiable. So what we're saying is, uh, well, let me read this one first. Um, phi is a non-deterministic uh, outcome of pi. It's one of the possible outcomes of pi, just in case it's not possible to rule out in advance that executing pi will produce a phi state. No matter how carefully you measure the current state of the world, it's going to be compatible with your measurement that once you then execute pi, you'll get to a phi state. It might also be compatible with your measurements if you'll get to a not phi state. So you're getting a true sort of um, notion of multiple possibilities here. But it's not key to any particular agent's knowledge at the time. It's key to this more general, well, maybe I shouldn't say more general. It's key to, key to this different notion of um, what, what you could come to know. And dually, uh, this is the, the, the corresponding dual in propositional dynamic logic that says pi is a guaranteed outcome of pi. No matter how the non-determinism of pi gets resolved, uh, phi is the case. And that, if we dualize um, by putting a negation on both sides of this modality, and we do the same thing over here, we end up with uh, this formula. So that says phi is a guaranteed outcome of pi, just in case, now we have the box, there is some measurement the agent can take before running the program pi that guarantees that phi will be true after running the program pi. So we've got topological interpretations of the non-deterministic program execution modalities of PDL. Right. So visually, you know, maybe this is the true state of the machine or whatever. Program. Um, and so as a matter of fact, if you run a program, it's just true that this will be the output state, right? But maybe your current measurement, your current observation, your current knowledge of the state of the system leaves open any of these five states as the possible current state of the program. And so from the perspective of that measurement, any of these five uh, output states are possible outcomes of running that program, right? Given this measurement. And as we quantify over measurements, we say, well, what can you find out by taking better and better measurements? We get to this notion of, uh, on the previous slide here, of what are the true non-deterministic possible possibilities of executing a program. OK, so I do want to go back to talk sort of in more detail about that understanding of non-determinism, because I just sort of threw up the definition and a picture and there's certainly more to be said about it. But before I do that, I want to sort of go back and do some sanity checks because 
um, you know, I, I'm telling a story here, and at least to me, it sounds like a good story, but there are some things to check to make sure that I'm, I'm actually doing something reasonable. So, and one of those things is that we should check that our topological reinterpretation of propositional dynamic logic is somehow related to the original propositional dynamic logic. I mean, it's great that I'm trying to give an epistemic interpretation to non-determinism, but if I just produce a different class of models, which are epistemic in some sense, in which the, the, the dynamic modalities behave completely differently, then have I really given an, a reinterpretation of PDL or have I just invented a whole different system, right? So what I want to show you now is that in fact, the reinterpretation, the topological reinterpretation I just showed you um, is true in some sense, the original uh, logic of propositional uh, uh, dynamic logic. So um, the way I'm gonna do that, the part, at least the part of that I'm gonna show you in this talk is um, through looking at this axiomatization. So the most basic version of propositional dynamic logic, and I'm gonna restrict my attention here to uh, serial um, propositional dynamic logic. That's, um, that's where I insist that um, each program has at least one possible output, so programs can't simply crash. Um, that's not something that I wanna insist on forever, but it makes the, uh, the easy case a bit, a bit more straightforward. So I'm, I'm gonna do that in the talk and we can talk about partial, partial functions uh, later. Um, but the most basic version of serial propositional dynamic logic, and by basic I mean without additional operations on programs, which is also something I'm happy to talk about later in this paper. Um, it's axiomatized uh, as follows. So it's just the propositional tautologies, the sort of distribution scheme for each um, box type uh, pi modality, uh, this consistency axiom scheme, which is basically corresponding to seriality. It says that it's, it, it's, it says that if uh, every execution of pi produces a phi world, then some execution of pi produces a phi world, which is equivalent to saying that um, there is at least one way of executing pi, and then modus ponens and necessitation for each of the box modalities. Um, and this shouldn't be surprising because if you know anything about modal logic, all I have here is um, a bunch of copies of different box operators interpreted via different accessibility relations, and the only restriction on each one is that it be serial, which is picked up by this scheme, and so otherwise it should just be axiomatized by the sort of basic uh, K system for um, standard uh, propositional modal logic um, plus these D schemes. So this is the axiomatization for serial propositional dynamic logic. Let's call it uh, SPDL not. And uh, the, to, to, to make precise what I want to prove, let's note that we can interpret the language of propositional dynamic logic. That's the language that has these modalities in it in dynamic topological models via our characterization. And it goes by way of the definition that I gave you, but it doesn't rely on that. So what, do I, what I mean is, uh, I told you that I wanted to interpret um, this symbol. I wanted to reinterpret it as, uh, as this statement. So I wanted to interpret the possible outcomes of pi as the unfalsifiable outcomes of pi, where pi is interpreted deterministically. Okay, now to interpret diamond or to interpret circle, I need topolo topological structure and I need functions respectively. Um, so I need to do that in uh, uh, dynamic topological models. But I don't really need this language to interpret um, this symbol because once I give cement, once I unravel the semantics of diamond circle, I just get, I'm taking the closure of the pre image of the set of five worlds right? It just requires that X be in the closure of uh, the set of worlds that map to a phi world. That's just the semantic unwinding of this formula here. So I can interpret the standard language of propositional dynamic logic directly in dynamic topological models by ignoring this line here and just saying I'm giving a new semantics for formulas like this. Instead of defining them in terms of accessibility relations, I'm going to define them in terms of topology and functions. It's the closure of the pre-image of phi. And so now I have two different semantics for PDL, the classical one and this new topological one. And what we can prove is that under these semantics, um, the same axiom system is sound and complete 
uh, it's a sound complete axiomization of the language of propositional dynamic logic, right? The one that has these guys in it, with respect to the class of all dynamic topological models. So even though I totally switched the models, I've thrown the accessibility relations away, I've replaced them with functions, I've put topological structure on top, I've reinterpreted the modalities, I nonetheless get the exact same axiom system being sound incomplete. So that is at least one sense in which I'm not just doing some random new thing. I'm doing the same thing that PDL was doing, but in a different and richer class of models. Um, so this is for people who are curious about uh, how to prove that. Um, so I'm just going to do sort of one, one slide on that because uh, in, in general, I'm not a fan of delving too deep into like technical details in a slide presentation that doesn't tend to go well. I'm happy to talk about it more though. And of course the details are in the paper, but um, to prove, I mean, to prove soundness, you just kind of do it directly and to prove completeness, we uh, make use of a model transformation result, which is a sort of, of independent interest. What it says is that if you take any serial PDL model in the classical sense, right, a model that has these accessibility relations, we can construct from it a new model, which is a dynamic topological model, right? So I can construct a new state space, equip it with a topology and functions for each program and evaluation um, in such a way that for each state in the original model, there exists a state in this new model that agree on all, on the truth values of all formulas of propositional dynamic logic. And of course, once I can do that, that gives me completeness because uh, anything I can refute in one of these classical models, I can now refute in the corresponding dynamic topological model because of this agreement. And the way to construct that, uh, this is where it gets uh, more technical, but it's, it's kind of what you would expect if you have expectations about um, this type of thing. Um, the points of the new model are formally networks of our pi path through x. And the intuition, without going into the details, is just um, the points are essentially encoding all possible future executions of any combination of programs. And, you, and I have to do that because in the original model, I have non-determinism uh, baked in. It's baked in by the fact that these relations can have multiple, multiple possible outputs. In order to replace these relations with functions, I need to expand the state space so that the states themselves pre-encode all of these non-deterministic choices that you can make as you execute programs. And so that's just what this construction does. You, you, you build a, a bunch, you build a new model where the points are networks of R pi paths that sort of cohere in the appropriate way. You put a topology on them by grouping together uh, networks that start at the same point, right? With the idea being that that's what you could observe in the original model. So that's what you should be able to observe in the new topological model. You define the functions and evaluations in the obvious ways. And then you prove the theorem that says that you get this, precisely this agreement. Okay, so obviously that's not meant to be understood in all the details. It's just a sort of uh, sketch of, of, of how that transformation result works. Okay, now I wanna go back to talking, and this is sort of the, the, last, um, the last act of, of, of this talk. I wanna go back to talking about non-determinism. And I wanna approach it by starting with the question of how to interpret continuity. And there's, there's a bunch of reasons to do this. Um, the most obvious reason is that it's going to turn out that continuity is uh, keys into a very important notion in terms of non-terministic program execution. So I already know that. So I, you can just trust me that we should think about continuity. But there, there, there's at least one other reason that we want to think about continuity is that um, in some sense, to topology exists to support the definition of continuity. So anytime you see topological spaces, it's very natural to ask, okay, and what is continuous? And why do we care about what's continuous here? Uh, that's not true sort of absolutely in every case, but it's a good uh, sort of um, guess that um, when topological spaces are involved, the, the, the point is somehow gonna be uh, in terms of thinking about which functions are continuous. Um, and more than that, in the, in the framework of dynamic topological logic, which I referenced from uh, 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 Kramer and Mintz, um, they specifically restrict their attention to continuous functions, which is not something that I did, um, but it's still something that we can ask about. 
So let's talk about continuity for a sec, because not only because it's important just generally for topology, but because, like I said, it's going to be important for our analysis of non-determinism. So let's remind ourselves a function is continuous in, the topo in a topological space if the pre-image of every open set is open. That's the sort of slick, you know, it's, it's a very sort of minimally worded definition of continuity. It actually obscures a lot of the intuition of continuity, but it's so slick that you sort of forgive it for doing so. But intuitively, uh, continuity in topological spaces means exactly the same thing that continuity means in like a familiar setting, like uh, in functions from R to R. A function is continuous. What that means is that very small changes to the input produce very small changes in the output. So continuity, as always, is a notion of uh, control. As long as you can exert sufficiently strong control on the input to the function, you can get uh, uh, control over the output of the function to whatever degree is desired. And if you sort of picture in your mind like a, a classic example of like a jump discontinuity, like a, you, know, you graph a function and you have to take your pencil off the page and start it somewhere else, that's exactly a case where at that point uh, you have this radical loss of control because no matter how much control you exert over the input, the output is either going to be on, you know, like up high or down low, depending on which side of the discontinuity it lands on. So you end up losing control. And that's what a discontinuity is. It's a loss of control. That's just, these are just intuitions to sort of motivate what follows. So the question is, what does continuity correspond to in the present framework? And to answer that question, I'm going to make use of a very beautiful um, result from uh, dynamic topological logic. Uh, it's, it's, it's certainly not due to me, but I, I, I do find it very beautiful. And that is that much like, um, a, as you know, in sort of um, like standard uh, like, uh, modal logic, things like transitivity of the relation can be characterized by a formula in the language or reflexivity or seriality, blah, blah, blah. In dynamic topological models, continuity of the functions can similarly be characterized by a formula in the language. And this is the formula. It's not an easy formula because it involves nesting modalities and that always makes things harder. But it's, it's also not a, a totally awful formula. Um, and so uh, for me, I, I, really, I really sort of adore the fact that you can characterize continuity of the functions in the object language here, given that it's actually a very simple object language. Um, so let's, let's read this formula. We need to understand this formula to understand what continuity means. So it's an if then. So let's start with the uh, antecedent. The antecedent says if after executing pi, phi is not only true, but measurably true. So if after executing pi, phi is measurably true, then it's possible to take a measurement right now that guarantees that phi, that guarantees this, that guarantees that phi will be true after executing pi. Okay, so what we have is, it's an if then, like I said, and what's happening is we're changing the order of the modalities. In the antecedent, we're saying, it's talking about first you execute the program, and then it's telling you that it's possible to measure that phi is true. And so it's saying if first executing the program and then taking a measurement can get you the truth of phi, then it's possible to take a measurement now before executing the program that guarantees the fact that executing the program will make phi true. So the continuity axiom, continuity of the function is characterized by a formula scheme which uh, as an axiom scheme says, whatever you could learn about the state of the system after the program is executed, you could also learn in advance of executing the program. So the continuity axiom just directly says, whatever you could learn about the state of the system after executing the program, you could in fact learn before executing the program. And what is that? What does it mean if anything, how would you describe a program that has the property that anything you could learn about the state of the system after the program has been executed, you could have learned before executing the program. Well, that's determinism. That's what it means to be a deterministic program. It means exactly that you're not, for example, a random number generator, where in a random number generator, 
you execute the program and you learn something like the number was seven. And the whole point was that you couldn't learn that before executing the program. That's what makes it a non-deterministic uh, program. And this is the negation of that. This is saying uh, whatever you could learn after you execute the program, you could learn before executing the program. That's determinism. So continuity is determinism. Now, this understanding refines our earlier intuitions about non-determinism. And I want to emphasize this. This, this I mean, at least for me, this gets a little bit tricky. I want to be careful in, in, in reading this. Um, it may be that no measurement at a particular state rules out all the other states. Right? This is very reasonable if, for example, you're thinking of, you know, think of your laptop, and maybe it, it implements random, random number generation by uh, drawing from some entropy pool, which is maybe it comes from uh, uh, the last like 10,000 keystrokes and, and mouse movements, or maybe it takes a measurement of the temperature of the core CPU PU and applies a function to that or something. Um, there are internal states of the machine that you don't have access to, right? So we shouldn't be able to, we shouldn't expect that um, determinism requires us to be able to fully know everything about the state of the machine, right? What determinism requires is that anything that it's possible to learn in advance, sorry, it may, what it requires is that it's possible to learn in advance everything that you could know about the effects of executing pi. So take out, take the like print the first line of the database program. I want to call that deterministic. Now it's true that after I print the first line of the database, there'll be tons of things I don't know and can't know, like the current value in the entropy pool. But that doesn't um, matter for determining whether my program is deterministic or not. All that matters is uh, whether, going back to the scheme here, whether the stuff that I could learn after the program is executed, I can learn in advance. Stuff that I can't learn even after the program is executed, okay, I just can't learn that stuff. That's, that's irrelevant. It's only the things that I can learn after the program is executed that I want to be able to make sure I can also learn before the program is executed. And so topologically, that's exactly why it corresponds to continuity. Continuity is a lot weaker than demanding that I can know everything about the current state of the system. That's not what continuity says. It does not say that it's possible to take an infinitely precise measurement. It doesn't say that. Continuity says it's possible for me to take better and better measurements in such a way so that anything I could come to know about the output, I could come to guarantee by my measurement on the input. Okay, these Zoom talks are a bit rough because it just feels like I'm, I'm just doing a monologue for an, an unending monologue, but I hope this is understandable. And, and if not, maybe we can come back to it in the question period. But here's a picture which maybe helps, I don't know, but it's like here we have the true state of the system and some uh, succession of better and better measurements. And it may be that even my best measurement is not telling me the exact state of the system. It's, it's compatible with these two. I just can't, I'm never going to be able to tell maybe uh, whether the system is in this state or this state or this state. But if the types of things that I want to, that I have questions about are things like, is my output state a red state or, or, or a white state? Is it a plus state or, or a not plus state? Well, it turns out that by taking a good enough measurement in advance, I can figure out that the output state is a red plus state. And it's not because I know exactly what the output state is, it's just because I can take a good measurement so that I can learn anything that I need to learn about the output state. Okay, so um, that sort of completes the, 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 um, the, the core of the talk, um, introducing this idea of topological epistemic interpretation of non-determinism. Let me end with a sort of nod to uh, uh, what I think is an, an, an interesting and important extension of this framework. Again, I'm not going to do it in detail. I'll try to keep this short because I think I should be ending in the next five minutes or so. Um, so uh, so let, let's note that this interpretation of non-determinism, it's epistemic in some sense, right? But not because I'm using knowledge. I specifically rejected the use of knowledge uh, because it gave counterintuitive results. It's epistemic in that it's involving knowability via these, this topological structure. Um, but even if knowledge is not the right concept to use in defining non-determinism, 
I may still want a system in which I can reason about um, non-deterministic program execution at the same time as I reason about knowledge, right? So that's the question. What if I want to reason about knowledge too? Not to define non-determinism, but also just to reason about it, reason about it in parallel and in concert with uh, non-deterministic program execution. And uh, for this, there's this uh, concept called topological subset models, which are um, just very well suited to representing both knowledge and knowability. They're basically like topological spaces that include a little bit of extra structure to talk about not only what's knowable, but also what's currently known. And uh, these have sort of, uh, you know, they've been around for a while, um, going back to, I guess, the early 90s. Um, but they recently, there's been sort of a, a resurgence and in interest in them. And uh, for example, they underlie some previous work on interpreting public announcements in topological spaces. And uh, there, the key idea is reinterpreting the precondition for announcing phi to be not only the truth of phi, but the knowability of phi, which makes a kind of intuitive sense. For phi to be announceable, it has to be not only true, but knowable. Um, and they've also been used sort of in a more philosophical context um, to study uh, the interplay between knowledge, knowability, and belief, wherein uh, a sort of famous uh, principle proposed by Stolniker, uh, I guess he didn't really propose it, but sort of popularized by Stolniker, um, called uh, strong belief, which is if you believe phi, then you believe you know phi, can be weakened in this kind of uh, more general framework to something like uh, if you believe phi, then you believe that phi is knowable. You believe that you could come to know phi, even though you might not currently know it. So that's not, that's just to give a sense of how these, how these have been used in the past. Um, but right now, let me just tell you what they are very briefly and, and, and show how they could be useful in the current context. So uh, a topological subset model is just a topological space with evaluation, just like before. The only difference is that we evaluate truth with, with respect to pairs, not individual states, but pairs, where the first element of the pair represents as before the state of the world, but the second element represents is a set, a set and a topology that represents the current knowledge of the agent, right? So X is the actual world, the actual state, and U is the current information state. And I'm going over this quickly because uh, I don't want to dive too much into the details just to give a sort of high level overview, but um, we interpret uh, formulas sort of in the usual way up to here, knowledge is interpreted with respect to the given information state. So you know phi just in case phi is entailed, is true at every, at every state in your information that's compatible with your information. And phi is knowable if you're in the interior. So we're using the same interior semantics for knowledge, uh, sorry, for knowability. And then we're using effectively universal quantification over the information set for knowledge, which is exactly the sort of standard Kripke style bounded universal quantification interpretation of knowledge. So we're just doing both at once in a somewhat different looking way, but uh, it's, it's really capitulating some things. And then we can extend that, expand that to dynamic topological subset models, because of course the goal of any logician is to make sure that you maximize the number of adjectives in front of the word uh, model. Uh, we could do that by incorporating um, functions as before. And what's missing is we need a way of defining uh, subset style semantics for the dynamic modalities, right? How do I define um, next uh, after pi phi? How do I define that? I mean, it's clear enough that I should probably apply the function to the state just like I did before, but uh, I now also have the information set. What do I do with the information set? Right? When I execute a program, what happens to my information? And probably the most natural thing to do with the information set is to carry it along for the ride, right? Every, every state that you before considered was a live possibility, um, the output of that state on executing the program pi forms your new set of live possibilities. And if you're paying attention to the, to the details here, um, you can see that this, this kind of definition is actually only going to work if we know in advance that um, when we apply the function to an information set, the, the result is also an information set, namely that the function preserves openness, or it's sometimes just called the function is open. So if the function is open, then we can make this definition. Right? The dynamic modalities are interpreted just by applying the functions. Um, we can axiomatize the system. Right? This here is the scheme. This O scheme is the scheme that 
uh, we need to capture the fact that the functions need to be open. Otherwise, these schemes end up looking a lot like the schemes from uh, uh, temporal logic. Um, and if we want to do this where the functions are allowed to be partial, we need to be a little bit more careful in a bunch of places to take into account the fact that functions can sort of crash, but that can be done too. So all the details of this uh, documentations are in the paper if people are curious. Um, but the point of, of uh, bringing this up was to end with the following uh, observation. In this setting, where I think go back, where I execute a program and uh, you know I, I'm initially in some state with some information and then afterwards I'm in some new state with some new information which is just the sort of push forward of my old information set by the by the corresponding function. Um, it it my I mean my information changes as I do things, but I don't really learn anything in the sense that every live possibility is always preserved in the corresponding state. If y is something that I consider possible right now, then after executing pi, I consider f pi of y possible in the updated information state. So I'm never deleting states. I'm never really learning anything. The intuition is I'm never really, I can't really learn about the past in this semantics. So you might think that we should uh, incorporate some tools from dynamic epistemic logic, expand it even further, like incorporate public announcements to represent acts of information update. But I'm not going to do that because, in fact, we already have the tools natively in PDL um, to uh, represent learning. And this is what I'm going to end with, this idea of using test programs to represent learning, which I think is really cool. Um, in the standard language for propositional dynamic logic, uh, we sometimes extend it to include test programs. It's written, so you take a formula phi and put a question mark inside it. Um, and the interpretation of test programs in classical PDL, which involves a relation, is just um, uh, uh, y is a possible output of the test program from x, uh, just in case y is equal to x and x is a phi world. So in other words, the test program does nothing if phi is true, and otherwise it crashes. So it's just testing whether phi is true. If it's true, it stays in the same state. If it's not true, it crashes. And this process, of course, is already deterministic. It corresponds to a partial function, right? namely this partial function. Do nothing if p is true for some primitive p, and otherwise you're undefined. The partial function that implements a test program. Um, now, like I said, we need these functions to be open to make sense of the semantics, which is equivalent to asking the question, what if p is true but not measurably true at some state? What happens if you execute the test program there? And the intuition that I want to give you is that at such states, the program should crash. Because even though p is true, by assumption, it's not measurably true. So we can't determine that it's true, even with a test program. So our take two for the definition of a test program in our new framework is it's uh, defined if and only if p is measurably true, in which case it does nothing, and otherwise it's undefined. Now we have an open function, so we can use it. And we have the following semantics just by unraveling the definitions. What happens if you execute the test program for p, you apply it to x, and you apply it to each point in u to get your updated information. And when you unravel it, what you get is uh, the next for phi is true after acting the test program for p ends up as this, namely that phi is true at x, and you've updated your information set by intersecting it with the interior of p provided this is defined. And this definition coincides exactly with the topological definition of a public announcement of P. So when I said before that I didn't want to incorporate public announcements, it's not because I want to do it in a different way. It's because actually uh, test programs in propositional dynamic logic already give us public announcements right, via these definitions. OK, so I'm going to end there with just a couple of further questions. I think there's a bunch of them. But um, uh, one thing we could ask, I, I, I gave you uh, semantics for how to interpret public announcements of primitive propositions and if you like Boolean combinations of them. But uh, it's less clear how to interpret public announcements of epistemic formulas. So that's something that we might want to uh, uh, expand the semantics to be able to do in this setting. Another thing that I didn't talk about in this talk, although there's a discussion in the paper, 
is um, in, in propositional dynamic logic, it's standard to talk about operations on programs, like taking the union of two programs or sequencing two programs together or taking uh, the cleanly star, which is like sort of a non-deterministic um, uh, repetition of a program. Sorry, when I said the union of two programs, what I mean is non-deterministically choose between doing one of two programs. And this one is non-deterministically choose some number of times to repeat a given program. And these are used to define things like, uh, like uh, loops, um, which are of course useful constructs in, in programming languages. And the question is, can we import these non-deterministic operations into our framework? It seems like it's hard to do that because our framework is deterministic. So maybe it's better to focus on deterministic analogs like um, if then else constructions or do until constructions rather than these non-deterministic repeat some, num some unknown number of times type constructions. So this is another sort of area of, of ongoing work. And uh, lastly, what I want to flag here is um, there's an interesting question, I think, of whether we can augment this framework to give a formal epistemic theory of probabilistic non-determinism, right? Um, quantitative non-determinism, which is what you might call chance. And if we follow the same philosophical line of reasoning that we did in this talk, and we try to apply it in that case, at a very high level, we get the following idea, which is to represent chance not as an external feature of the world, right? That would be like the analog of the, the R pi relations, nor as an internal, purely subjective feature of the agent. That would be like the, um, you know, the, the, the possibly quite ignorant agent, the interpretation using knowledge that we rejected in the beginning of the talk but instead as a combination, a relationship between the world and the agent's ability to gather information, what they could learn in principle. So this sort of merges two broad philosophical traditions of interpreting chance, sort of a frequentist interpretation and a subjectivist interpretation, which can be sort of um, married through these tools of topology. Uh, at least that's the, that's the hope. I'll stop there. Thank you.